you're in the rant wormhole where I rant about whatever my $15 a month plus patrons want me to rant about. This rant comes from Duncan Austin, who wants me to rant about the Evangelion franchise, specifically the rebuilds, saying he doesn't like to plebe in the weeb, so he didn't watch the one on Rebuild 3.0. Well, I don't know what to tell you, buddy. I reviewed the movie in that video, so I don't know how to, like, tell you anything that would be different from if you watched it. Just go watch that video and you'll hear all my thoughts on Ava 3.0. Granted, I also talked about them in response to Mr. Cynical's video, so by now you definitely know my thoughts on Ava 3.0 um, if you watched that video. But, uh, the, the one ranting about the curse of Evangelion. But, um, in any case, when I watched the rebuilds was back when 2.0 came out, uh, the first one is pretty much just the first six episodes of the show, again, um, you know, the, it's missing a little bit of detail, it's missing some of Shinji's adventure away in episode four, I, I would just say it's, you know, by nature of condensing the story, some stuff is left on the cutting room floor, the ending is more hype, you know, the battle with Romuel is more hype, but do you really come to Eva for hype? I don't know, I mean, I think it's, it's worth watching both, it's not like having one takes away from the other. Then you've got Ava 2.0, and at the time, I really loved it. I thought it was a really interesting way of reimagining the the bulk of the show because um, Anno had sort of talked about how the point of doing the rebuilds was that he he felt as though he wanted to sort of re-explain these ideas to a new generation. That, like, perhaps the original Eva was not clear enough or that like not enough people understood it um, in a deeper way or that it wasn't just well communicated enough. So he wanted to try to tell the story again in a way that would resonate with a, a modern audience. Um, I don't know how much of that is just, you know, corporate speak for I want to make Eva because it makes a lot of money. But, um, you know, the second movie changes things pretty radically. And, you know, you could make the argument that it's it's just... Uh, a less interesting or less nuanced version of the same story, and I would agree. It's, you know, it's it, it inherently loses out on a lot of the properties that something has by just virtue of having the time and space by being just... I, I think Hideaki Anno is a better director for this story than Kazuya Tsurumaki is, who I think is, like, really the main director of the rebuild, since it feels like his style. Um, you know, you come away with something that feels more like you're watching Fooly Cooly than Eva, um, with the badass moments and the real cathartic visuals that Anno was never known for. Anno's visuals are restrained and orderly and more about the beauty of individual shots and what they communicate, more so than making something badass and fun, you know? And then a lot of people like to look at it and say, well, oh, the point of number two was that it was this big cathartic, you know, badass moment, and then you get to the third movie, and that, you know, subverts all of that. And sure, that probably was the point, but it it doesn't, it doesn't resonate with me by doing it that way. Like, it doesn't feel like a naturally evolving story. Like, if you watch the original show, there was no moment where it had to subvert everything that came before and go, ooh, it was actually about this. It's like, the story just naturally evolves. The characters progress in a, in a way that makes sense, you know, and you feel it from the way the story is told. It's not beating you over the head with the point. Um, and if that was what Anna was going for, because not enough people understood the original, then, you know, then great. Maybe more people will get it now, but it was a clumsy way of doing it. And I, a lot of people paint it as though the second movie, like, radically went against the grain of what Ava was like, and I didn't feel that way. It just kind of felt like certain scenes were more hype-focused, but it, like, it didn't feel to me like, wow, this has fundamentally altered the entire story. Like, um... You know, it's it's not as though the actions taken are are radically different from the actions taken in the original. It's just that the presentation is different. It's just that it's it's more extreme, more intense, um, and in many ways not as good. But it's a different story in in in, in a in a way. Like it's it, the way it handles the relationships between Asuka, Shinji, and Rei is the biggest difference. Where. Uh, they are a little bit more of waifus, and that's, you know, it has its pros and cons, 
Makinami Mary is kind of just a meme character who's just there to have a new toy to sell, I think, but she's fun. Like, I don't know, I don't begrudge the movie for being a fun time. I think it's fine to have a fun movie. It doesn't negate the existence of the original Ava. And maybe that's why I find the third movie so annoying, because it feels like it's trying to say, oh, you liked that, you liked that catharsis? Well, ooh, we subverted everything, and it's like, well, that's not clever. You just made a shitty movie that that feels completely disconnected from what came before it. Um, and, like, it exists solely for the purpose of making that element of the message clear, which is not the intrigue of Evangelion. You know, it's, it's, it's nice that that's a point that Anno feels the need to hammer home, and it's not like I disagree with the message per se, it's just, like, I like Ava because it's a good story, um, first and foremost, so, yeah. I kind of already talked about that with the Mr. Cynical video, though, so, um, there's my thoughts on the rebuilds. Obviously, I love Eva, I have a billion videos about it and i never shut up about how much i love it so yeah uh check all that out and watch the goddamn plebe and the weeb it's a good show put a lot of fucking effort into that shit see you next time you're in the rant wormhole where i rant about whatever my 15 dollars a month plus patrons want me to rant about you can get one of them by becoming one of them today's rant is for rika fag who wanted me to talk about his video the curse of evangelion i'm a level with you i couldn't make it through this video uh, partially because it's boring, and partially because I got frustrated. Now, the thing about it is that this video doesn't exactly make whatever point it's trying to make clear from the start. What seems to be the point is that he's going to defend Evangelion 3.0, which, uh, I already was on, on edge at the mere suggestion, because I think that movie is fucking terrible. Um, so he's, he, he's basically, like, lays it out like, this movie gets a lot of shit, but let's talk about Ava uh, in general. So he goes through and analyzes the entirety of Evangelion and, and End of Ava in a very broad way, uh, talking about basically zeroing in on the theme of loneliness and how it's, you know, a meditation on loneliness and overcoming it. Now, the problem I already had with this take is that he basically says, like, all of the technical details, all the story elements and shit, none of that really matters. What really matters is that it's a, the, the themes. And already I disagree heavily with that implication. Because what matters in Eva is everything in Eva. The themes are not inherently interesting. The way that the show explores the themes, yes, it does a great job. And it says a lot of great things about that theme of loneliness. But that is not what makes the show good. And I don't remember if this video is out yet. I One of my Let's Argues, I've got like... Four of them that are that are scheduled ahead but uh, in one of them I talk about how a show being deep or having deep themes does not make it good what makes a show good is being a good show having great themes is just one way a show can be good but to say that Eva that what makes it good or what makes it interesting is these themes or that these are the point is to miss like 80% of what's good about the show what's great about the show is that it is superbly written and directed what's great about it is that the imagery is iconic that the character designs are iconic that the they every character is so well written and has so much great dialogue that they are explored in so much depth and are so nuanced and believable that the world is really interesting that yeah all that sci-fi concept all the plot shit yeah it doesn't really like matter in so far as it's not the point centrally but it all adds texture and flavor to the story that makes it interesting if you just had just the elements of the story that he talks about it wouldn't be interesting and so as he's going through eva and summarizing it in in a way that is you know it adds nothing to like i i understand that he felt the need to explain the basic point of Ava and sort of prove it to people before he goes on to talk about the other stuff. But he's talking about it in in terms that if you do know the point of Eva, you're not learning anything here. It's just a very, you know, uh, just a very straightforward explanation of the basic themes explored in Eva. Um, and so that part was just boring to me. And I watched through it I, at 2x speed because Rika Fag has a very uh, monotonous delivery. Um, and... I was just like, okay, yeah, whatever. And then he starts, you know, jumping into the rebuilds and it and the, the what the the movies have to say about the audience and being anti-escapist. And I'm like, okay, this is the same point everybody makes when they defend the third movie. The 
the point everyone says is that film number two was meant to be like the escapist fantasy action version of Eva, and then three is where you have a fallout from the consequences of of being that way and like once again assuring you that escapism is not the answer. Right. I get that. I get that that is the point of the movie and that that's why some people like the movie, but the movie sucks. It's just bad. Like, first of all, it doesn't look good, in spite of the fact that it has all these the very modern trappings, all this crazy CG. It has some pretty good art design, but just the shot compositions, the way that scenes are directed, the character designs, it doesn't look as good as the original TV show or the original film, you know. It, uh... It just, it doesn't have the same flavor and character, and the movie is fucking boring, because all of the characters are impossible to connect with, because they're all just assholes. The whole movie is, all these characters you love are assholes now, and they all act shitty and out of character. They don't seem like a logical next step of their characters. You know, Asuka acting the same way 14 years later, and being the same person that she was before, it doesn't seem right, that there's no evolution. And the world is completely uninteresting because it's just a post-apocalypse where we don't know anything about what the fuck happened in the last 14 years and everybody's being mysterious about it, deliberately. Like, the whole movie is just, oh, well, you know, everything you knew about Ava is irrelevant now and now you're in a post-apocalypse world and there, none of the characters seem like the same characters, so there's no reason to care about any of them. And the story is basically just constant exposition dumping about shit that doesn't matter, um, leading up to a painfully edgy bullshit climax. Uh, I hate the movie. I don't give a shit about what it says thematically if the movie is bad. So, you know, without addressing that point, it's hard for me to give a shit about, like, defending the movie on the basis of themes. Everyone's already said that before. Like, that point has been made countless times. Goat Jesus was always parading around how much he loves 3.0 for those exact same reasons, you know, on YouTube. So, like, I understand, you, you know, maybe you haven't seen other people talk about it or you just wanted to be more complete in your presentation of that angle of why the movie is good. But, like, again, it doesn't address my concerns about the movie. Maybe he does. I didn't watch the whole video because I got really bored and I kind of skipped through and it seemed like he was saying the same shit that's been said before. And I was just like, this is this is beside the point. The, the point is the movie's bad, you know. Uh, so that was how I felt. Uh, sorry if that's not the response you were hoping for. You're in the rant wormhole where I rant about whatever my $15 a month plus patrons want me to rant about. You can get one of these by becoming one of those. This one is from Shiva's Guard, who wants me to rant about my dream team of voice actors for Netflix's redub of Ava. I can't... I can't even put one of these together because... I don't value dubs. Like, I don't value this idea of having a dub. Like, I don't, I don't need that. I have the Japanese audio. I have it. I can just watch it in Japanese. I don't need the characters to be recast. Like, to me, the, the character, whoever voices the characters in a show is like, it's a very big part of the show. It's a very big part of its, its meta, of the time and place that it takes place, you know, that, that, it, that it was, that it comes from, of, like, how I understand these characters. Like, Rei is voiced by Megumi Hayashibara, the voice of the 90s. Um, I can't imagine, like, separating that, you know? Like, it's, it's too, she's been in, like, every thing that Anno does, basically. Like, he, she was in every single one of the, um, the, uh, Animator Expo shorts, for instance. Like, that relationship between the creator and the actor, actress, like, is a part of the experience for me. When I watch Ava, I can think about the fact that that's Megumi Hayashibara and that she's been in all these Gainax things and she's worked with Ano so many times. Or Kotono Mitsuishi playing uh, Misato, which is not only probably the best performance in the show, but then she, you know, clearly nailed other roles from that, doing things like Excel and Excel Saga, um, like her 
being in the booth reading Oruchuban Ebichu to the Gainax staff is why they adapted that into anime. You know, like, why do I need a dub? I don't need it. <laughs> There's no, it adds nothing to the show for me. I can just watch it until I've, like, like, you know, I've got subtitles, and I don't really, like, I don't have to, like, go down and, like, read the subtitle. My eyes just bounce back up. But, like, you know, I can just memorize it. Like, I can just memorize the script of Ava from watching it enough times, and I won't even need the subs. I will just know what they're saying. Fully drink in the Japanese voice acting. I just don't see the appeal of having a dub. Like, to me, dubs of anime exist because there are people who can't fucking read. Like, that's the only reason that you would ever dub anything. If there's just people who are t either too fucking dumb or just don't want to do it because they're assholes. Like, I don't get it. I don't see the appeal. I don't understand why anybody wants to watch dubs ever. I don't see the point. It was made... It was made with these voices in mind. That is the show. The show is the one that has the voices it has. I mean, I understand that, like, if you get into a show through the dub, you might have a relationship with the dub. You know, like, there's a lot of people who insist on watching Fooly Cooly dubbed because they grew up with it. I grew up with that dub. I watched it probably 10, 15 times. I don't give a fuck about that dub. Because I watched it in Japanese, it was way better. Because in Japanese, Haruko is voiced by Mayumi Shintani. Once again, a... Uh, and a, a a real actress, like not non voice actress, but like physical actress who's been in a lot of Gainax shows and nothing else. She's even in Cutie Honey, the live action movie by Ano. Like I love that like meta text element. I love her voice. I love that in the Japanese version they used non actors for all the children, so that they have you know they just like more realistic tone and tenor to their voice, which adds to the feeling of the show because it's even even weirder when all this weird shit is happening when the anime starts off not feeling like anime at all. Like, you hear Naoto and Mami Mi talking and it doesn't sound like a couple of anime voice actors. It just sounds like a couple of kids talking and then all this crazy shit happens, you know. I just... I just don't think dubs are ever worth it. I don't think they're worth your time. They are there as a marketing tool. They are there to draw in dipshits who can't read so that they'll watch the goddamn thing and, you know... If that's the only version they ever watch, well, I guess fine for them. But they're missing out on the, like, what I would consider to be the core experience of the media, which is the one that was what the creators intended and, and set out to create. And they made these casting decisions with a purpose, you know. And, and also, the dialogue is written in Japanese. So when you translate it, something is always lost in translation. And no, I don't think that just doing a, a good job of, like... Um, of localizing it preserves the meaning. Like, you are changing the meaning. You're making a different show. And that can be a good show, but it's not the same show. And I'm not interested in watching the show that the dubbers made up. I want to watch the show that the people who made the show intended it to be, you know? And I want to have a full grasp of what they were going for. You could make the best dub of all time, and I don't know why I would want to watch it over the Japanese, unless the Japanese version was totally bad and unremarkable, you know? Like, I'm willing to watch some Ghibli movies dubbed just because, not that the Japanese versions are bad by any stretch, but they do tend to be kind of stilted and weird. Like, Miyazaki, he also hires a lot of non-actors, but not necessarily for the same purpose. And, uh, you know, like... I just don't think that the dialogue is ever, like, the strongest part of a Ghibli movie anyway. Like, I really want to drink in all those visuals. But, like, eh. Either way, it, it's really just a take-it-or-leave-it kind of situation. Like, it's not that I prefer to watch them dubbed. It's just that I will. Because I don't care that much about the Japanese audio as compared to most uh, anime that I watch. But, like, <sighs> I don't even know any actors like, I don't know who I would pick for my dream team, uh, other than Endless Jess. My ultimate dream dub of Ava is that Endless Jess plays every character. Because he's the only man in the world who understands them all perfectly. He's the only man who truly understands Ava. Except for me!
You're in the rant wormhole where I rant about whatever my $15 a month plus patrons want me to rant about. You can get one of these by becoming one of those. This one is from Matthew Renekamp who says, Rant about Netflix giving cock torture by dropping these tweets out of nowhere after 3.0 plus 1.0 news and making a fan feel the franchise is or will be mishandled. As Funimation's president said, As I see cringy like the second impact, it'll be worldwide. Replies and gifts that are unrelated to the comments. I mean, will Netflix normies make it worse? Do you think you and Jess, the defenders of Ava fandom, will survive a larger scale of Too Deep for You? I don't think Anno will get more death threats, but fans don't like Ava because they're happy. Is there a market now for people to see Ava for the first time? Think about finishing the series to understand the memes, or not understand Ava, but not discard because they saw a similar the apocalypse but inspiring apocalypse but inspiring ending madoka or utna or something mainstream i can't think of utna is by no means mainstream um okay so the cock torture you're talking about like he's talking about a netflix netflix put out a string of tweets where they were making an ava announcement and i guess he thought it was going to have something to do with the last movie which makes no sense because Netflix announced that they were going to put Ava on Netflix like ages ago. So, of course, they were just leading up to a release date. Um, there was no reason it would be anything else. But, uh, yeah, do I think a bunch of normies are going to swarm the Ava fan base? No, I don't think almost anybody's going to watch Ava on Netflix except for people who already like Ava. Um I don't know how big of a deal Netflix is going to make out of the fact that they're putting Ava on there. I mean, clearly the the Twitter at least is is hyping it to some degree because they they're thinking it's Ava, it's a major release. But like, I don't I don't know if like just based on iconography or description, the average person would ever click on it. I mean, there's tons of fucking shit on Netflix that nobody watches. Like, there's Netflix original anime that they they themselves help to produce that doesn't get seen you know like did you watch last song have you well i guess revisions hasn't actually been posted on the american netflix yet but like be the beginning like nobody watched this shit like they didn't do a good job promoting it and maybe they'll do a better job promoting ava but like i think the main people who they're expecting to watch ava on netflix are people who want to watch it again people who don't want to have to bust out the dvds or who don't have the dvds um who've had to watch it illegally or um you know, or who are looking forward to the the supposed redub that's that's I guess happening. I mean, maybe they really will push it. Maybe they'll try to, uh, you know, like market it as like, oh, this is the classic anime that everybody cares about. But like, I really don't see Joe Schmo watching a fucking four by three 1995 fucking anime that is slow as fuck and uh, you know going to bore them to tears, and they're not going to get it, and they're going to think it sucks. You know, like there's already a huge contingent of people who hate Ava out there. You know, it's always been a controversial show. It's never been a show that has, like, universal praise, and especially because of its reputation of being so legendary and so supposedly good, tons of people go into it either ready to hate it or who watch it not because they think it seems like something they're going to enjoy, but because they feel like they're supposed to because it's a classic anime. And so, um, you know, if anything, the biggest the 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 biggest backlash i expect from this is people who are already anime fans who have heard of ava that they're supposed to watch it who check it out on netflix and come away complaining about it or maybe loving it you know it could go either way but like i that's already what it's like it's just going to be easier for people to do that but um i don't think putting something on netflix is like opening it up to such a huge, wider world. I mean, you can just fucking type, watch Evangelion into Google, and you can watch it right the fuck now on whatever streaming site you happen to find, you know? So, like, I don't think we're at risk of a, a giant normie invasion in the Ava sphere. Um, people are going to act like it's happening one way or another, though. So, you know, get ready for that. You are in the Temple of the Rants, where I rant about whatever my $15 a month plus patrons want me to rant about. You can get one of these by being one of those. This one's for Cozy, who says, Hello, please rant about the live-action scene in End of Evangelion. If you don't remember where it is, it comes right after Kam Suster Todd. Uh, a piano rendition of Bach plays over it. If you haven't rewatched End of Ava recently, please just rant about Asuka. I have rewatched it recently, and I went ahead and watched the live-action segment, because it's easily findable on YouTube. Um, 
it's a pretty neat little section. I think it mostly exists to kind of cool you off in the middle of all the fucking insane shit that's going on. And so that when, you know, you go right from that into the ending, like the first shot after the live action scene is Ray's neck splitting open with the blood spray. So it's kind of like, in order to make it so the two different scenes of just insane apocalyptic imagery that are transpiring, to have like a harsh break between them that is so different that it allows each of them to have equal impact. I think that's kind of what Anno is going for by putting this moment in the movie and it also sort of suggests the you know what Shinji is rejecting is the fantasy world of being inside of you know the 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 mind meld with everybody he wants reality he wants to go back to the real world and uh you know end the escapist fantasy if you will that is what anime provides so yeah going back to reality is a good way to represent that it's it's really funny seeing like the the characters as real people just you know like girls in in cosplays um there's a tit shot there's a random tit in there looks really good really good tit um you know you see Tokyo 3 as though it were a real city all these power lines and shit, uh, and of course some, you know, some dialogue, who gives a shit. And then there's the shots of the theater, where it's showing, like, uh, I assume probably from a filming of the Death and Rebirth film, that, like, they probably had a camera in, like, whatever the first showing was, and put that in the other movie. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just, like, there's the double layered shot of the the crowd as though they were all being melded into one and then after shinji you know has the dialogue where he's made the decision to not mind meld then it's just everybody you know normal and then an empty theater since everybody's fucking dead i assume that's what this is all symbolizing um and then of course you see all the gynax death threats right before ray's fucking head <laughs> starts coming off so Yeah, uh, Anno says, "Yeah, you wanted the real ending. Here you go. Here's the happy ending, as I see it. The happy ending. Not everybody sees it that way." You are at Lake Rant, where I rant about whatever my fifteen dollar a month plus pages want me to rant about. You can get one of these by being one of those. This one is for Kcorn three two one, who says, "Can you please rant about the hospital scene in End of Evangelion?" Mainly how it made you feel to watch it for the first time, an overall view on how the scene was handled, and also how the scene comments on the otaku lifestyle. Also, in the Kiss anime sub I watched it on, Shinji closes the scene out by saying, I'm so fucked up. However, the Netflix subtitle reads, I'm the lowest of the low, which I think undermines the entire scene and takes away a lot of the impact. Any thoughts on this? Well, um, the first time I watched the movie, I did not even realize he was jacking off. Um, I just straight up didn't get it, didn't notice. I did notice the I'm so fucked up line, which I liked a lot. Um, but I, uh, like, basically heard about it on the internet later, and that was when I truly appreciated that he had jacked off and said that. And to me at the time, I just found it incredibly relatable. Just, like, it was... Everything about Shinji I found relatable at the time. Just the idea that he's so lonely and tortured and confused on so many different levels that he, you know, would even would even just jack off in this scenario um, and, you know, just be like, what the fuck is wrong with me? And I, I felt that way around that age myself. Um, so, like, on a personal level, I was just like, yeah, I'm so fucked up too, you know? And uh, I kind of took it as a... A code. I mean, I've put that as a lyric in a bunch of my songs and stuff and just referenced it a lot. So, I love the scene. How it comments on the otaku lifestyle, I mean, you could view it in the sense of, like, you know, um, seeking escapism through a, a, a hot anime girl. I mean, Shinji's literally jacking off to a hot anime girl's tits in context. And, like, she's passed out, so there's nothing she can do about it you know she's not um she has no agency in the situation he is just using her for his own um you know his own sexual comfort so 
I think there's a pretty easy parallel to draw there towards, you know, jacking off to anime. Um, and uh, just generally, yeah, again, it's, it's just about being so, so far gone, essentially, that you, um, that you just don't know what to do with yourself, you know? Um, and the I'm so fucked up translation is great just because it has a lot of impact in English. Like, I'm the lowest of the low is a literal translation of the same thing. And, um, you know, I've been reading some stuff online about why the Netflix translations are so literal and that this is probably studios, Studio Kara's fault because um, after Ava 3.0 debuted at Otakon, it was full of, like, double entendre and sexual innuendo between Shinji and Kaoru that uh, Funimation had put in there and the audience was going, like, totally apeshit with laughter and someone from Kara was at that showing did not appreciate this reaction to the movie, and they started cracking down really heavily on translations of the movie, making them, uh, on, on, of Ava, making them extremely literal. Um, I'm willing to believe that's exactly what happened. Personally, I think that probably a lot of people wouldn't be complaining if not for the fact that we had that original script. Like, if it weren't for the fact that the original translation had left such an impact on us from watching the show for the first time, I don't know if we would find it so, you know, um, appalling to see these new translations because they don't really mean anything different. They just don't sound as good in English. And I don't know how much it sounding good in English contributed to the memorability versus just, like, what literally happens. I mean, definitely in the case of I'm So Fucked Up, that phrase had a ton of impact. Was it, um, was it meant to even be seen that way is a question. I mean, in that case, I would definitely prefer the original translation. I think that it's, um, it's unfortunate to not get that, especially when that's already in the public consciousness about Ava. Like, that's already how we refer to that scene is in terms of that translation. Like, you're never going to be able to change the way that that is perceived in the West, um, in a broad sense. So, you know, uh, Someone needs to petition Studio Kara, I guess, and be like, yo, dog, you guys got to realize your new translation's not as good, and um, American anime fans are just spazzes. That's why they reacted that way to the movie sh screening at Otakon, because um, they react that way to every movie screening at Otakon. Um, yeah, I would say it's less impactful. I wonder how people react. I mean, again, for me, I literally didn't even realize Shinji was jacking off in that scene the first time I watched it. I only found out through the internet. So, you know, maybe other people will end up feeling the same way. Um, you know, they won't even notice what's going on, and then they'll have to hear about it later. You know, you spend enough time with this show, and your perception on it's always going to change over time. I mean... I watched the show for the first time when I was 14, a lot of it went over my head. And a lot of the reason that I made the Ava videos that I did back in 2015 was that in rewatching the show, I just had just now come to understand all those things. It wasn't like, oh, this is all stuff I know about Ava and I'm going to analyze. It was like I would watch an episode and go, oh, this is what that episode was trying to say. Or, wow, this is really interesting. And then I'd write about it, you know? Um, so... I don't think that the, the initial viewing and initial impact is perhaps even as important as the longevity of spending time with the series and talking about it and communicating with other fans. And uh, that went off the rails. You're at Lake Rant, where I rant about whatever my $15 a month plus patrons want me to rant about. You can get one of these by being one of those. This one's for Neon Mobile Suit Avan Gundam, who says, Rant about the final scene from End of Evangelion, the scene where Shinji chokes Asuka. What do you think it all means? How do you feel about that whole scene? I love when people ask me about Ava because they always get the most views. Um, well, that scene, I think the main point of the the end of Ava is about, of course, coming to the decision to deal with other people, to not sand away all the differences between us and become, you know, one hive mind, but to to decide that you you, in spite of the pain that will come from the fact that you don't perfectly understand each other, it is worth continuing to try to communicate so that you can preserve the things that are different about you, which is what makes you 
valuable as a person, at least in the opinion of Asuka, for sure. Asuka is a character who absolutely thinks of herself as the only person she wants to be. She would be completely disgusted to have to share an existence with Shinji. And if the two of them were to be combined into one, it would fundamentally be the death of her personhood as she sees it. And that's why she refuses to go into the the hive mind, the LCL, where everybody else goes. You know, everybody else is essentially making the decision to go there. Like the Ray clones show up as the person who they want to share an existence with, many of whom are people who, you know, have already died. And so they want to be there with those people because they they have no other recourse for you know for for being able to be with them so people choose to go into this giant bubble and they choose to all be one but ultimately what Shinji concludes is that like if we are all one person then there that's still that's just one person there's no other person to communicate with we haven't achieved communication we've just achieved um, you know obliterating like uh, the you know the, the parts of ourselves that aren't already in other people so to speak so he makes the decision that he's going to continue trying to communicate and so I think that you know him strangling her on the beach is representative of that tension of the the fact that he you know this is like the most primal form of like disagreement it's like uh, when you really can't take someone anymore, you choke them, you want them, you're just trying to choke them to death so they'll shut the fuck up, you know? And uh, he's choking Asuka because he's, the communication with her has reached a complete breaking point, but then he eases up because he decides, I'm going to continue attempting, even in spite of the fact that Asuka is completely disgusted with him, in spite of the fact that there is nobody who he could have a more damaged relationship with, a more difficult time communicating with. They already don't understand each other. They already have been at much as much at odds personality-wise and communication style-wise as they could possibly be. And he has harmed her in many ways, which will make it very difficult. And she has no interest in communicating with him, but he still concludes that it's worth continuing to try. And... Uh, you know, that's why I view it as an optimistic ending. It's like, even at the very, in the position where it is as difficult as it could imaginably be, still deciding, well, that's better than just being combined with everyone else and having, you know, no one to actually communicate with, no progress to be made, no understandings to be reached. And I think if you tie this into the themes of something like, uh, I don't think it's as explicit in Ava that the reason why it's good to have those multiple perspectives is evolution, the ability to create new ideas, the ability to create new people, you know, the uh, ability to progress. You can't really do that as one hive mind, you know. I think, like, Darling in the Franks kind of explores that idea that, like, when there's no new humans being made, the ones who are here just stagnate, and there's nowhere for them to go, you know. Um, and I think that's kind of like carrying on the themes of what's going on in a lot of Gainax and Trigger shows. I have to wonder if like, if back in the day they would just like sit around the office and have discussions about this kind of shit and that's why everybody is so informed by it who, uh, who works there in those places. Hard to say, but uh, yeah, that's what I think is going on there. You are at Lake Rant, where I rant about whatever my fifteen, uh, whatever my patrons want me to. You can get one of these by being one of those. This one is for some guy who says, rant about the Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.0 preview. Here's the footage. So this is like five or ten minutes or whatever of <coughs> the fourth rebuild movie. <coughs> oh my god, it's finally happening. It's been a fucking eternity. Um, but I gotta say, watching this clip, I'm not particularly interested I'm not going to front and act like I paid attention to this and read the subtitles and watched it all the way through. I was just kind of glimpsing at it. But, like, first of all, I don't like the aesthetic of this movie. I didn't like the aesthetic of the third one, for the most part. Uh, it had some memorable imagery in it, but we don't see any of that in this trailer. And it's just like, oh, all the girls are in plug suits now! <coughs> plug suits for Ritsuko Akagi in a plug suit. That's what I always wanted. 
But frankly, it just feels like the exact same as the start of 3.0. <clears throat> like, I don't know what 3.0 plus 1.0 means. But what we're seeing here looks exactly like the beginning of 3.0, where it was like a similar operation and uh, it was equally incomprehensible, equally full of still shots of characters talking back and forth about shit I don't care about, um, equally full of Makinami Mary Illustrious. Like, I don't know, it looked exactly the same to me. So I was just like, well, I'm still not interested in this. Uh, if it comes out, and I, I mean, I'll probably watch it because why not? I can talk about it. But uh, and I'll be interested in, of course, watching all the rebuilds together. But we'll see what happens. I guess you are at Rants Incorporated, where I rant about whatever my ten dollar a month plus patrons want me to rant about. You can get one of these by being one of those. This one is for Diamant, who says, "Hey, Digi, please rant about your favorite and/or least favorite Evangelion episode and why, not including end of Evangelion." Oh boy. So my favorite, I mean, I really love the first nine episodes of Evangelion in particular. I mean, there's obviously lots of great ones throughout the show, but like the first time I watched it, the ones that had left the most impact were like the insane, violent, crazy, fucking mindfuck shit that happens later in the show. Like episode 16, getting trapped inside the fucking, you know, the black bubble and having to tear its way out. Um, the one where he fucking kills, uh, Toji's mech, the one where he, uh, you know, where, where the Ava rips apart the angel and fucking eats it. Like, those scenes were the ones that left by far the most impact on me the first time I watched the show, because they were just so fucking insane. And, you know, the animation's incredible, the visuals are incredible, everything about the way that they are dramatically led up to is perfect. In terms of, like, how... The, like, the show's story, like, how you remember the show's story, I consider those, like, the best episodes. The big dramatic twists, the crazy stuff that happens. Um, and, you know, a lot of the themes of the show really come to the forefront in that period. But it's that coming to the forefront, I guess, is the, th is the thing about it. Like, those scenes have a ton of impact the first time you see them. And you will always remember them, and they're fun to rewatch. But they don't, like, give you more the next time. It's like, when you see the first episodes again, with the perspective that the rest of the show has given you, you get more out of it, you know? And you keep getting more, because the more you think about these characters, the more that seeing them in their natural state is interesting. Whereas, I think that, you know, maybe this is something that is core to, like, a difference I have of opinion with other people about media, but, like, what I get the most out of is scenes of characters interacting. Like, that's what I like the most, is, like, the conversations, the characters bouncing perspectives off of each other, having reactions emotionally, you know, as a result of these interactions. And in the plot of a show, to me, is to facilitate those interactions more so than anything. Like, it's also to facilitate cool moments and, you know, interactions that might be action, you know, uh, centric. But, like, it's... It, it, the interaction of two Avas fighting is easy to understand on the first pass, you know, maybe even a few more. I mean, there's a lot of detail in every episode of Evangelion. There's a lot of detail in the animation. A lot of stuff that you will only notice as you keep going through it. But, like, just the scenes of the characters interacting, the more believable the characters feel to you, the more meaning will be packed into those interactions when you think about why that character's saying the words they are and what it says about them and how it, you know, how it interacts with the rest of the statements that they've made. So, like, for me, like, the first episode is basically just this really good setup of the tone and ideas, and it's mostly about just, like, the great cinematography and uh, building this setup. And then you get into this sort of little arc of Misato and Shinji trying to understand one another, Shinji trying to come back around to, you know, going to Nerve, and, like, the just insanely humane interactions of Misato and Shinji, the way that all of Episode 4 plays out, uh, 
is, you know, to me, like, a lot of the emotional core of the show is right there in those early episodes. And then the arrival of Asuka, like, the episodes eight and nine are the most exciting, the most dense, the most fun. Every fucking image in them is iconic. Everything, every interaction, like, Asuka makes so much impact in these two episodes. It's like no other character in a show before. Like, she just completely steals the show, redefines the whole nature of it, turns it into a different show, essentially. And then, um, the midsection, though, is my least favorite area. And, like, you know, I think... Magma Diver's fun. The day to Neo Tokyo uh, stood still is fun. They're not, like, as impactful, in my opinion, as, like, the earlier episodes. They're more about the cool action scenes. They're, they're about, like, really fun set pieces and fun interactions and just getting to spend time with these characters, like, together, doing normal stuff for a while. Um, you know, getting, like, a peek of what this show would be like if there was, like, a lot of episodes of it, you know? Um, and I think that does a lot to endear you to the show and characters, but, like, um, you know, they're not as, like, rich as the ones that come before or after. And then the, the worst episode is definitely the recap, uh, just because it's a, half the episode is recap and the other half is reused animation. Uh, so, yeah, it's certainly not the best. Um, but then you start getting into, like, all the psychological mindfuck shit and the plot gets really out of control and insane. So, um, I, I also tend to distinguish the episodes in the second half less, unless they're one of those ones I mentioned, like, the big pop moments, just because it is more complex. Like, when you're watching the earlier episodes, they're almost completely episodic. Um, and then in the second half, there's just way more, like, plot threads weaving in and out of each other, you know, like, setups in certain episodes leading to payoffs later, so it's harder to talk about it in terms of individual episodes anyways. Um, like, if I were to continue my Evangelion episodic series, I think I would have to, you know, like, consider what combinations of episodes or how I wanted to tackle certain story story threads that aren't limited to, like, singular episodes or just two in a row, you know, two-parters. Um, and then the last two episodes I would also put into, like, the least favorites category because, like, even though they blew my mind to fuck when I was 14, like, watching them back, it's so just, like, intro to... Like, it feels like a YouTube video about, you know, thinking um, in a... Uh, thinking, like, metaphysically, you know, like, it's, it's good. It is, they are good episodes in terms of being, like, interesting product and something had to be done, but, like, in comparison to what came before, they are just, just not even remotely close. Like, it's not that I dislike the last two episodes of Ava. I just think that, like, to think of them as being on par with the rest when they are just, they're just simply unfinished, you know? And, like, I appreciate that people can like them. You can like them as much as you want, you know? Like, and, or even appreciate the unique way that they handled going about this problem that they had. But, like, a lot of it is just, like, you know, color-graded photographs of shit around the fucking studio. Like, they, there was, they ran out of shit they could use, you know? It's just, like... It's not that I think that that makes it bad. It's just that, like, the rest of the show is just fucking godly, you know? So how can you even compare the, the scenes of unmemorable photographs of fucking the studio? I mean, they're memorable in the sense that they're in Ava and part of, you know... Obviously, they're part of history. Obviously, they're important episodes. But to consider them good, I just think that's a little bit much, personally. But, you know, it is what it is.